we're looking at the uh, the Born approximation for the adjoint, uh, approximating the inverse of the acoustic wave equation, and we have these amplitude terms for that basically describe the amplitude versus offset or AVO of our reflecting points, and under this um, Wu and Aki approximation, uh, uh, asymptotic approximation, uh, we have a, uh, a delta incompressibility that's much, much less than the full incompressibility. We have a delta rho that's much, much less than rho. And the reflection coefficient, as it were, um, depends on these, um, these deltas. Um, and you can see that the uh, in the incompressibility 1k, there's no dependence on, on angle. And in uh, the, the density part of the reflectivity, this asymptotic reflectivity, there's dependence on theta, this angle theta, whatever it is. <clears throat> okay. Now, the um, and and this is the <clears throat> you know the full um, linearized amplitude at uh, at that uh, of the reflection. Okay, so that's what gets multiplied by the time derivative of the source time function, <clears throat> and then also multiplied by or scaled by really the uh, uh, amplitude factors, which really re just represent geometric spreading. They could also represent q. You could even make them uh, um, frequency dependent if you wanted to. But uh, all of that is uh, very simple under WKBJ theory. And we also need a simple and linear relationship between our perturbations, delta k and delta rho, and the, uh, the reflection amplitude. And that's what the Wu and Aki theory provides. So now the reason that this is expressed this way in terms of this uh, cosine theta is that it's, we think of it, each reflecting point, as an effective point source with a particular radiation pattern. So in the acoustic case, which is all I've described so far, a delta k, you know, of course, if there's no, if there's no, if delta k is zero, right? There's no incompressibility perturbation. Then it it generates zero reflectivity. All right, but if uh, delta k is uh, not zero, it can be um, it can be negative, right? And then uh, it would generate a negative reflectivity. Okay, but uh, if it's non-zero then um, what we see is the effective point source is an explosion. And so you know, these diagrams are for waves coming straight down, okay, that are heading straight down onto the reflecting point, which is right here at the center of each uh, uh, of the little set of axes here. And then these are polar plots of the, um, of the reflection amplitude uh, versus theta, and so theta increases, um, you know, from zero, right? So zero would be a normal reflection, which is the kind we're used to, and 90 degrees would be a side reflection, if you like, and 180 degrees is pure forward scattering. So uh, zero degrees, you know, we reflect back. That's the classical normal incidence reflection, and then 180 degrees is a very non-classical um, forward scattering, or as we might classically call it, transmission across the. Uh, it's not really a boundary. Remember, delta k is very much less than than the total k, so we're not t changing. You know, let's say this is a flat reflector, we're not changing k by very much. So really, we're thinking of it as a point, um, a point scatterer, a ball bearing that's embedded in a in an otherwise constant medium. At least that's how we, we think about it. We let the, the con, you know we don't have to have a constant medium. We can have a smoothly varying medium through which we can trace rays, WKBJ rays. 
So the, uh, the delta k is a point explosion. A non-zero delta rho um, is a, uh, if it's a positive delta rho, then it's a point force, a point force toward the source, right? The, the source is up here somewhere, and the waves are coming down straight, uh, at least as, uh, and of course, hitting a, a if infinitesimally small point reflector, uh, it's always a, a plane wave. Yeah. If it's a, like a ball bearing we're hitting, why does the angle matter? Uh, right. Uh, um, because uh, uh, a, if the ball bearing is, is purely a, uh, a change in density and not a change in K, uh, so you could do that, for instance, uh, by embedding a steel ball bearing in an aluminum block. Okay, so K doesn't change very much, but uh, rho does change. All right, you'll see this character that ball bearing to an incoming acoustic wave will act as a uh, as a point force, and you'll see, for instance, zero side reflection at an ang at a theta of ninety degrees. <coughs> The, the uh, theta is the angle between the incident ray and the and the scattered ray. Oh right, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so you know if 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 everything produced the uh, uh, the point explosion right, um, then we wouldn't have to worry. Uh, uh, you know, uh, our reflectivity would be purely. Uh, uh, independent, completely independent of angle. Okay, we wouldn't have to worry about the the uh, the dip of the reflector. We wouldn't have to worry about where the you know the incident angle, the the scattering angle, um, the angle incident back on the receivers. None of that would matter. We wouldn't have to track any of that. And in fact, if you look at at my simple migration codes, they don't track it. Okay. So. Um, uh, you know what we're assuming is that uh, is that theta is not a uh, not a factor, but by knowing that theta is a factor for delta rho variations, okay, that's where we get some ability to look at our data and try to distinguish between a delta k um, uh, scatter and a delta rho scatter. All right, and that could be useful, right? Um, you know, the occurrence of oil or, or gas will show up as uh, much more strongly as a delta rho scatterer than a uh, a delta k scatterer. For for an example, a useful example. Okay, now you know um, you can. Uh, if you take uh, velocity as uh, the square root of uh, k over rho, right? The, in the acoustic world, p velocity is that. Then uh, you can consider just from these diagrams, you can consider, uh, you know, so this is uh, one times uh, um, delta k over over k, and this is uh, cosine theta times uh, delta rho over rho. The uh, this pattern here with the point force. If uh, the delta rho is negative, then the point force points down, points away from the source. All right, so you know that um, uh, then delta v is going to be uh, the square root of delta k over delta rho. And uh, so uh, using this either 1 or, or cosine theta um, geometry, you can come up with this uh, um, some kind of Lisa Joux figure. I can't. I don't know the equation for it. It's in Ronan's thesis. Um, so uh, uh, a pure delta v that has no impedance contrast, okay? Uh, no delta. You know, we can look at delta v and delta i. These are just other ways of looking at the the medium. Other ways of parameterizing the same medium, okay? So if we have a uh, a delta v contrast that is not Delta impedance, then notice that it has absolutely zero uh, normal reflection coefficient, and the strong its strongest in forward scattering. 
If, on the other hand, um, you know you take the delta v and you multiply by uh, delta rho, okay, that's a uh, delta i and um, a delta impedance, and that is uh, much stronger on uh, on backscatter uh, on backscattering on normal incidence reflection than um, than any other direction, and in particular forward scattering is is zilch. Um, so the uh, uh, you know our, all of our experiments are designed to uh, uh, to look at at backscattering, to look at normal incidence reflection, and of course we have to extend our experiments to longer offsets to um, be able to assess uh, you know even forty five degrees right, and uh, you know. It's only really beyond forty-five degrees that these are uh, uh, theta. Beyond forty-five degrees theta, that these are noticeably different, right? So we have to do uh, you know a different kind of experiment, different kind of reflection survey, to really assess the difference between uh, you know delta k and delta rho. And um, uh, this also means that most things that you see in most seismic reflection sections, most of the reflectors. Are delta i, they're delta impedance contrasts, and we don't design our reflection um, our reflection experiments to get uh, um, delta v contrasts. So we we have de-emphasized the uh, the forward scattering. Uh, of course, up near the surface, up right near our sources and receivers, we are going to see lots of forward scattering. So there's actually you know through your reflection your migrated section. You know, if you're not paying attention to the angle, uh, as I don't, um, you're um, you're going to be uh, looking at a, a view of that includes both backscattering and forward scattering, and uh, and then as you go deeper, you know, and get down to you know the cable length and then beyond the cable length and depth, uh, your maximum offset, your um, you're going to be looking at uh, more and more backscattering and less and less forward scattering. All right. So, uh, and we're going to come back to this for the elastic case. So I'll have a, a chance to hammer it uh, into you uh, once more. Um, so where are we going with this? Now, this linearization, this uh, Wu and Aki uh, linearization, it gives us the ability to express the forward problem. As a projection, okay, which by which I mean a linear operator. So we take a uh, a model C, okay, which is a um, it's a column vector of two column vectors, all right. So um, um, and uh, uh, here I'll just write it as uh, you know we have a I'll write it as two. Um, scalar fields, right? We have the scalar field a one, which is delta k over k, uh, you know, as a function of x and z, and then there's another scalar field that on the lower part of the column vector c, which is a two, which is delta rho over rho, again at every pair, a uh, different value for every pair of x and z. So that's our Earth model, and that's our our rock properties in this acoustic world. This B is our linear Born operator. So this, this is what handles all the, uh, the wave propagation. It handles all the, uh, um, the amplitude coefficients. It handles the source and the derivative of the source. Okay, All that is built into the Born operator B. And then you operate on B, you operate on C with B. And you get D, which is the reflection data. Okay, and you know in this two D in this two D world, as I'm expressing it here, of course it's a three D multi offset data set. All right. So let's write. Uh, uh, we can't quite write B all by itself. Okay, but we can write B operating on C. Okay. So we have the uh, the, the Born approximated Green's function, 
we're going to take the uh, you know the wave propagation Green's function forward forward Green's function, which is uh, g zero, right? Um, that's the direct waves, which we're going to drop and ignore, plus g zero v g zero, right? So here's g zero. This g zero here is propagation from the um, uh, from the source to the reflecting point. V is the uh, is the uh, um, uh, the reflect the uh, reflectivity potential, okay? So that's going to involve the the model, uh, the reflectivity model, which is is a one and a two fields, and then g zero. The next g zero here takes the uh, waves from the uh, the reflector back up to the receiver, okay? So now we can write uh, b applied to c in terms of, of uh, g, right? Um, so uh, and and here I'm trying to write it in terms of a time domain convolution. All right. So it's uh, the source wave of t, uh, and actually it's the time derivative of the source. No, I'm sorry. It's the source wave of t um, convolved with uh, the the first g zero. From the source to the reflector, and that's convolved with the uh, reflectivity, uh, somehow rendered into the time domain, and then uh, that result is convolved with the final g zero, which takes the reflectivity up to the receiver. So what we'd like to do is um, we want to now now remember, uh, and the reason I inserted the the stars here for convolution later is that. For convolution is is that uh, we want to remember here that uh, convolution is an integral. Okay, so um, that begins to give you an idea of how we actually accomplish this operation, b applied to c. You know, it's via it's via an integral. Okay. Um, just because it's easy to uh, it's easy to write down and, and it's easy to remember that it's a convolution, okay. Instead of you know I can write it in the frequency domain as s of omega right and everything in omega, um, but then it's not so you know then it's already been integrated into the Fourier domain, and uh, you know and we're just doing a bunch of multiplication so it's hard to remember that we've done the integration that we what we really need to accomplish here is an integration, multiple integrations really. Okay, so now we wish to back project, right? We have d equals b applied to c, and what we want to do to solve our problem is we want to operate on the data with something, and we want to have that equal to c, which is our model space. Okay, or at least give us an estimate of c. So according to the um, um, According to the tomographic approximation, what we really need here is B transpose. Okay, if you remember from uh, you know Gene Humphreys' uh, travel time tomography, uh, sure, you know you end up you 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 get the normal equations and you want to invert um, uh, L transpose L, you know, and, and L is is kind of our our you know is the Travel time tomography equivalent of the Born operator B that we have here, okay. Uh, but but remember, I I, I kept uh, I kept claiming that the um, L transpose L inverse is just some scalar, and in fact, if we overdamp the uh, the inverse, then what really what we do is is we just have a scaled um, L transpose, and so L transpose applied to um, delta t, the data, is is all we need. That's the that's the essential thing. So the question here is: All right, can we write out the uh, the Born uh, forward problem in such a way that we can easily find B transpose and attempt the same kind of tomographic solution of now the you know wave equation for the for primary reflections. Under all these assumptions, but uh, you know, and all this linearization, but uh, you know, we're talking about a, um, a an inversion now that uses the full wave field in in, so, in a certain way, 
it does use the full wave field. So it's a back projection of the full wave field, you know, not just the travel times. So how do we define uh, B transpose? Okay, well, it uh, you can go into uh, the theory of scalar products and inner products, right? So um, really, uh, um, uh, what we have uh, in this uh, in this here is a definition of a uh, of a scalar product, right? We have d is equal to b c, right? So if you take a, a a scalar product, okay, of the of the data and uh, and the um, um, and and um, uh, because d is equal to b c, okay, then uh, if you take a scalar product of d with b c, okay, then uh, there's a uh, a theorem in scalar products. Uh, maybe you've seen it in uh, linear algebra that uh, you can also take a uh, the result of that scalar product is also going to be the result of this scalar product, which is the transpose scalar product. Okay, uh, so B transpose D is going to be equal to C, and of course B transpose D is what we want. Okay. So the forward problem is d equals bc, which means if we take a scalar product of d times bc, right, that's going to be equal to the scalar product of what we want of b transpose d with c. Okay. Uh, and and here's a definition. You know, this is one of many possible definitions for a scalar product, and this is a uh, a legal way of defining a scalar product. Okay, so uh, uh, we're going to have a triple integral over a uh, <clears throat> over a volume x, y, and z. Okay, of um, and, and so uh, x uh, uh, and and you know x, y, and z are just dummy variables here, so uh, don't worry too much about that. So the scalar product of x and y is a triple integral um, <clears throat> of uh, x transpose y, x transpose uh, uh, times y uh, times uh, 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 integrated by x, y, and z. OK, so um, our operators are, are x, which is a function of uh, x, y, and z, and y, which is a function of x, y, and z. OK, um, now the, the operators that we have uh, here um, or the uh, the x and y's that we have here are our data, you know, with uh, source equals uh, x uh, sub s, which is a vector as you can see, so it can be three D, three D location vector x sub g and time, right? So we got uh, three variables there, and then um, uh, we've got our c, our our model space. Um, you know, okay, s is the data space. And v is the model space. V is uh, in x and z. The data space is x, s, x, g, and t. Okay, so composing the scalar product. Okay, here's uh, writing out you know d equals b c, and and really what we're getting is a full scalar product. Okay, of the data times b c, right? And we're going to insert our uh, our born forward modeling. Okay. And if you remember that, we uh, it was an integral over uh, over the um, over the volume, the x and z volume. So we're inside here. We're doing a double integral over x and z. If we had a three D volume, we could do a triple integral. That's no no uh, mathematical difficulty here. And um, uh, and there's our. Um, <clears throat> Our born forward modeling, which is uh, the time derivative of the source wavelet, you know, delayed by the uh, the um, um, uh, delayed by the uh, uh, imaging condition, you know, t equals uh, t s plus t g, right? Here's our Wu and Aki um, um, uh, reflectivity, 
right? A1 plus A2 times cosine theta, right? With the cosine theta distinguishing them. Here's our uh, WKBJ uh, um, geometric spreading amplitude coefficients, right? So that, all that gets integrated over the whole volume. And then we integrate, we, we multiply by the integral over all the data. And we're integrating across all the sources, all the receivers, and all time. OK? So um, the, uh, the model domain parts are in blue, underlined in blue. The data domain parts uh, in uh, this, over this uh, um, you know, seismic wave field uh, volume are underlined in green. OK? So now this is equal to this. And if we could write this integration down, then we might be able to see how to uh, how to do the um, um, how to do B transpose D. Okay, so B transpose D times C. Then we uh, we just rearrange, right? These are all everything in here is is linear, right? So we can mix up these the order of integration. We can mix up the uh, you know what's uh, what's inside what. Okay. And you can see that that there's because we're just reordering a scalar product. There's no division here, right? There's no um, there's no inversion here. There's no division. Um, so uh, um, uh, okay. So we're going to um, uh, to find B transpose D. Okay. Uh, on the inside, we're going to put the uh, uh, the data, okay. And so there's the uh, uh, there's the data, and it's multiplied by the time derivative of the uh, imaging condition shifted source wavelet, right? Under an integral, okay. That looks kind of like a convolution now, or I mean a cross correlation now, okay, because it's under an integral. We're multiplying, you know, down all time, right? And uh, we're uh, uh, we're packing it all in here, right? So there's the um, there's the model space um, and the amplitude uh, factors, right? So you know, basically, we're putting all the integrations on the on the outside here, okay? So now let's pull out B transpose D. Right, which is uh, uh, you know, which means we got to pull out. Uh, um, you know, what do we what do we do to get a one? What do we do to get a two? All right. So let's try to uh, look at this. So here, you know, this is like the master integral. Everything's uh, everything's integrate integrated together, right? And we're starting to mix up inside the integration. We're starting to mix up the um, you know all the terms. Right, and all the integrations are on the outside. Now we're going to pull out um, what we have for um, for each, uh, um, you know, a one and a two. Okay, so if we just want to extract a one, and and notice I put a hat over it. This is an estimate. This is a back projection. Okay. Well, and obviously we can't integrate over the uh, over the model space v. Okay. So we're not going to do the blue integrals, okay? What we're what's left to do are the green integrals, okay? So a one at uh, x and z, okay, is an integral over all the data over all of s, right? And in there we've got uh, we've got uh, the amplitude factors, right, from the from the source to the reflecting point and from the reflecting point to the receiver. Those are just the geometric spreading factors. We've got the uh, the you know we're multiplying by the time derivative of the source wavelet. Okay. Um, now for a one, what's the uh, coefficient there? It's uh, it's one. Okay. So there's a one in there, which we usually forget about. Okay. There's no you know that one. It means no dependence on theta, right? There's the, the data, okay. We're integrating over the data, right? One times the data, and then we're integrating, you know, 
all that gets multiplied together, and we're integrating over um, all the sources, all the receivers, which means over all the traces, and then uh, over all time. Okay, and that gives us a one. Um, so the the time integral, I, I especially want you to notice, is a cross correlation. And what are we cross correlating? We're cross correlating the data with the time derivative of the source wavelet. Okay. Uh, of course, delayed by uh, the uh, or advanced by the by the imaging condition time uh, T s plus T g. Uh, we're scaling that uh, that that integral by one for getting a one, okay, since uh, uh, theta doesn't matter, and uh, we're also scaling it by the uh, by the uh, um, By the uh, um, the geometric spreading factors. Okay, now now quickly here, same deal to extract a two or an estimate of a two. Okay, so we don't have to integrate over v, right? The uh, the entire uh, uh, model space. And instead of a factor of one, we got a factor. You know that cosine, that cosine theta is still sitting out there, and we gotta we gotta leave that in too. Okay. And so that's the only thing that distinguishes the um, um, the uh, uh, a one. You know, getting a one from getting a two, right? You know, otherwise they're exactly the same. We're we're uh, cross correlating the data against. Uh, uh, you know this uh, this in time here. That's a cross correlation integral, right? So we're cross correlating the data, the data against the advanced uh, um, um, source wavelet, a time derivative of that, and uh, um, and then we have these amplitude factors. Now, um, here's what what I consistently and constantly fail. Miserably to get across to my earthquake seismology colleagues. This is a back projection. It is not an inversion. Okay, you would think you would think that if you were doing an inversion to derive, say, a two. All right, you would take the amplitude in your data that comes out of the reflector, and you would have to correct that for. This cosine theta, and how would you correct it? You would divide it by cosine theta. Okay, now now and occasionally, cosine theta is going to be zero, and so then you have trouble. You know that's where you get your singular values in the in the inversion. Okay, you would think as well that you would correct it. Uh, you would correct your amplitude, your reflection amplitude, by dividing out. The um, the the uh, geometric spreading factors. Okay. Um, now uh, uh, that would be much like applying this uh, um, this uh, um, uh, that that's that would be much like applying this um, t squared. Uh, amplitude uh, amplitude correction uh, amplitude balancing that's in ViewMed. Now, what does that what does that t squared amplitude uh, amplitude uh, balancing do? Um, like to your data set, what does that what does that t squared do? It pulls out the amplitude of the deeper reflections. Right? right, and what is it when it's while it's emphasizing the amplitude of the deeper reflections? What else is it emphasizing? The noise. Yeah, I mean, where is there where is there more noise? I mean, relative to the reflection amplitudes, where is there more noise in the section? Yeah, there's a higher noise to signal deeper in the section. Right, right, and so so, you know that uh, that that factor um, is uh, is which is a, a a division, right? That factor is a division by the. Um, um, by the amplitude, the the amplitude spreading factor, the, the the geometric spreading factor. 
So it's it's actually killing the killing the amplitude up where the signal to noise is good, and it's emphasizing the noise down where there's lots of noise. Okay, but that that is the correct way to do it, right? I mean, it, physically that's correct, but it it doesn't work, especially for this kind of this kind of inversion, because it's emphasizing the noise. Okay. And then, and then, so if you have this, you know, the, the factor of one is no trouble, right? You can always divide by one, but the factor of cosine theta is trouble wherever theta goes to um, goes to ninety degrees, right? Then, uh, uh, then you're trying to divide by zero. Okay, but but that, I mean, you, you know, just thinking about it, right? And and thinking, oh, I've got to preserve amplitude. That's what you feel like you have to do, and I, ha you know, in my in my thirty year career, I have utterly and completely failed to transmit to any of my earthquake seismology colleagues um, the meaning and the validity of of the back projection that we're doing here, as opposed to the inversion. Okay, so you know, as reflection seismologists, we can come up with these reasons why. Uh, why the um, why the the uh, the inversions won't work, okay? Um, and and uh, you know what what Labras presented here, Labras and Clayton, what they presented here is a way of making them work. You know, notice that this this takes the uh, the noisy part of the sections. You know, these these a amplitude factors, the capital A's. You know, at large times where there's lots of noise, those amplitude factors are going to be small, and so this is actually cutting the contribution of noise to the uh, to the back projection. Okay, and and when uh, cosine theta goes to zero, no problem. Okay, then then just that part of the integral is zero. Okay, so so. You know this; these integrals here, this back projection, uh, this B transpose D, it works. It all, you know, it's not overdriven by noise. Okay, but what I can, what I, what I have not been able to communicate is that it is a solution to the problem. Okay, this gets the correct structure. This actually assesses. The correct difference between a one and a two. All right, as as you know, I'll show you some examples here in a sec from from Lebrasse's thesis. Okay, and these methods are are extremely well used. Um, the the reverse time migrations, the uh, um, the full wave inversion. Um, you know, they are essentially using the same integrals, the same back projection. Okay. Remember in the full wave inversion, uh, there's a cross correlation, right? Just like here, of the uh, synthetic data against the, the the real data. Okay, it's doing the same thing. Uh, and and so nowhere we don't nowhere in here are we dividing by the the capital A's. We are not deconvolving. We're we're um, we're cross correlating. Okay. We're not dividing by one or cosine theta. We're multiplying by one or cosine theta. So why why should this work at all? Okay. It's because of this. It's because of the integrals. It's because of the composition of the uh, of the back projection. Okay. So the uh, the the inner product theory tells us that uh, we we can make this arrangement, and thus. You know, as long as we're doing all this integrating, you know, as long as we're carrying out these inner products, that these are are good estimates of a one and a two, and we get it by multiplying by all by all these factors, never dividing them. Okay, so that is the nature of a back projection, um, and uh, uh, you know, I I I've. I guess done a pretty miserable job uh, explaining why this works, but the the community has has come to accept them. Uh, they 
the community is accepting these results of um, of the uh, uh, the RTMs and the and the um, um, uh, the full wave inversions, so called. Okay, and those full wave inversions, believe me, they use cross correlation. They never use deconvolution. Okay. Um, so the so here is a an uh, uh, an inverse, right? We're deriving here model parameters. We're deriving them from data D, okay, and we're getting them for um, we're get, we're getting them from uh, um, as a as a back projection. So this is a good you know just like the back projection is a first estimate of a uh, of an inversion. You know, we can see here that migration, right? This is exactly what migration does. But now we know a few more details, right? In in Kirchhoff migration, we have the source wavelet um, as, as a spike, which is uh, uh, which is uh, um, you know, so that's that time shifted spike shifted by the imaging condition T S plus T G, right? That's uh, that's um, Cross correlated with the data, right? So that's just you know cross correlating a spike with data is just picking out one amplitude value. That's what that original you know San Andreas uh, Kirchhoff migration did. Okay. Uh, and now we can see with a few extra amplitude factors, we can do a full back projection for you know that separates uh, incompressibility from density. Okay. Uh, Right, you know, B transpose D is very simply a multi-offset Kirchhoff migration summing over the data space and back projecting into the model space, and it weights by the geometric spreading. Um, it weights by the derivative of the source function and the effective point spread radiation of the median perturbations. Right, that one and cosine theta. Uh, so, uh, okay, I, I've said that this works. Does it really? Okay, here's a uh, here's uh, 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 remember the uh, FK uh, migration that that used the uh, that can separate uh, you know rho and k and um, um, and uh, um, you know you could do in constant velocity. So here's uh, 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 some reflections, and they come from uh, two different reflectors um, in constant velocity. And these are flat reflectors, okay? So uh, you know the impedance—they're uh, both impedance steps. Only one of them is a density step, and they're both k steps, okay? Here's the FK inversion, and you can see lots of artifacts. But uh, uh, you know, of course, this is delta i over i, so it's centered at zero, um, and that shows both of the reflectors. The delta k over k um, shows. Uh, both of the uh, um, both of the reflectors and the delta rho over rho, you could argue, is showing only only the top one, which is what it should do. Okay, so the FK uh, uh, works. Um, here's a uh, structural uh, structural model. Uh, we've got uh, uh, a small change in density, no change in uh, in velocity. Okay. So um, we have uh, uh, the bulk modulus image, the density image, okay, and uh, you know there's a, a little bit of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of artifact there. You can see that's wrapped around from the right side. Um, let's see. Oh, okay. So um, you know we can get uh, we can get some separation. We can get some structure. Okay, um, I'm going to explain the elastic case before I uh, um, before I launch into uh, the uh, 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 before I show you the uh, uh, the full uh, uh, the full inverse um, or the full uh, back projection. Uh, so let's uh, let's look at that real quick. Um, Okay, so what do we need to do in the elastic case? I mean, we might 
we might want to modify our um, our capital A impedance contrast. We're in uh, notes 15 now, uh, which uh, just has uh, uh, just has a few pages, um, and um, uh, so there's you know there's going to be differences to our sources. Our sources now, you know, aren't just acoustic. Our data are three dimensional. I mean, a three component. We have three component data. We have three component sources. Uh, you know, vector data, vector sources. Um, we have um, uh, and then we have uh, elastic medium parameters. Okay. So uh, now we're going to say, all right, A1 is uh, our true velocity over our, uh, over our, uh, our, uh, um, our background, uh, I'm sorry, our true density over our background density minus 1. This again is uh, delta, uh, A1 is, is in this case, in the last case, it's, uh, it's delta rho over rho. All right, A2 has to do with this Lame elastic parameter lambda. Um, and you won't see much in the literature about lambda. It's not k. Um, it's, um, it's, not, uh, um, uh, it's not Young's modulus. Uh, it's a different modulus. OK? And, um, and it's called lambda. So this is delta lambda over lambda. All right? That's A2. A3 is easier to understand. That's uh, delta mu over mu. Yeah. What's the physical meaning of lambda in this case? Um, yeah, I, I, uh, <clears throat> I struggled with that a long time until I finally saw, uh, you're familiar with the, um, the earthquake uh, moment tensor, uh, or the earthquake moment equation, where the moment of an earthquake is equal to um, uh, mu times a times d, where a is the area of the fault and d is the slip on the fault, right? So that's a that's a you know that's a shear fault, right? And and of course mu is the shear modulus, same mu we have here, okay? Um, so uh, um, the uh, uh, so the the earthquake moment for a shear earthquake. Depends on on seems very natural. Depends on um, on the shear modulus. Okay, um, so a cavity collapse. Okay, a vertical cavity collapse where a like a nuclear explosion cavity or or a mine cavity or a or a tunnel collapses vertically. Okay, that depends on uh, the moment equation for that is lambda. Times the area of the of the cavity times the uh, the amount of collapse, the vertical amount of collapse. So that's the best that I can come up with. Uh, that came from uh, one of our graduates, uh, uh, one of our alums, uh, Bill. Um, um, oh, uh, he leads a whole group down at, the whole seismology group down at Livermore now. Um, I wish I could remember his last name. Um, great friend, friend of uh, Ken Smith's, of course. Um, so that's the. Uh, so it's like a kind of compressional scaling energy factor. Well. Yeah, but it's not. You know, it's it's not K. It's not it's not incompressibility. Yeah. You know, it's like vertical incompressibility. Only so it has something to do with the. You know, it's like K, but but somehow scaled by the. Uh, um, Scaled by the uh, uh, Poisson's ratio somehow. Mm. So, uh, but that's the first physical description I can understand that that only involved lambda, and didn't involve also mu, and and rho. Yeah. 